Welcome to the One Minute Preceptor Podcast, your resource for clinical rotation advice and tips to prepare for your externships in healthcare. Learn how to earn letters of recommendation, prepare for your clerkship, and excel at patient care from preceptors with years of practice. We interview physician educators in every specialty and clinical setting to discuss how to prepare for your rotation and improve your clinical experience. Here's your host and MedEd entrepreneur, Chase DeMarco. Dr. Bradley Black is an ENT based out of New York and hosts the Physician's Guide to Doctoring, which explores everything doctors should have been learning while they were busy learning the Krebs cycle. Brad, how are you doing today? Great, Chase. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, it's great that you have this resource here, this material, this podcast, which we'll get back to in the end a little bit more to help guide current and potentially future physicians and different topics that we generally don't see in med school. And I love those topics myself. It seems to be something that's getting more popular now and definitely in profound ways important for physicians' future. So I'm glad that you have a very great resource out there for us. Thank you. Everyone should check it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. And we'll definitely add show notes. We'll add a link to the show notes and discuss that a little bit more. But I do want to start off with a fun little icebreaker question here, and that is, what is the most outrageous thing that you've seen in academic medicine? I don't know if my answer is really in the same direction that you were asking, the most outrageous thing. You know, I was thinking along the lines of what we are actually capable of in medicine that just to me seems so unbelievable. And as an ear, nose, and throat doctor, right, one of the things that we do is head and neck cancer the ablation, right, removing the tumors, and then the reconstruction afterwards. And so the most outrageous thing, when you're asking that question, the first thing I thought was like, one of the most terrible things, you know, outrageous, like I saw an attending punch a nurse in the face or something like that. Like I was thinking that type of outrageous. But then when I couldn't think of, of anything, I thought, well, actually what we do in medicine is frequently outrageous. And so one of the things I thought of was transplant. So as an ear, nose, and throat doctor, I somehow as an intern ended up on the transplant service. And at Georgetown Hospital, which is one of the hospitals I trained at, they do transplants that's like from stem to stern. So it's like stomach through colon. It's unreal. But then more to my field would be free flaps. So if you have someone that has, let's say they have oral cavity cancer and that cancer it's on the gums, but it's gotten into the bone. And so you need to just remove the soft tissue, the mucosa, but you need to remove the bone as well. You know, what we used to do is you just used to let them swing, as they say, which is like they, now they've only got one hinge of their mandible attached. You're hoping that it's just supported by the muscle and other soft tissues in there. But what we do now is we'll take fibula bone and the vascular pedicle, so an artery and a vein that feeds that specific area and take bone and the surrounding muscle and the skin, and you'll actually use it to replace some of the tissue that you've removed, including the bone. And you'll plate that bone in place in the same way that we would plate like a mandible fracture. So you put these little microplates in and then you hook up the artery in the vein to the artery in the vein in the neck. So now you've got a vascularized pedicle. So this tissue that used to be in the leg is now in the mouth. And when you see patients postoperatively, that mouth, sometimes it grows hair. So you're examining someone and you see these little hairs growing on the tissue inside their mouth. Now, most of the time, these patients, because of the advanced cancer that they have, they get radiation after surgery and the radiation actually takes care of the hair. So it's not like a prolonged problem most of the time. But I think that's pretty outrageous that we're taking leg and putting it in mouth, and it works. It's just unbelievable. Outrageous, use your word. That is, that is pretty interesting. Yeah, and that's why I like to also kind of make it a little vague. So it can be about some student preceptor interaction or patient interaction, or in this case, a surgical procedure. So I like where you went with that. And I think having unique views and unique answers for this really make it a great question too. So a little bit more about your history, your background. How did you get into teaching and what is your or have been your responsibilities in the past for teaching? So I'm in private practice. I'm not in academics. I am ENT at my practice called ENT and Allergy Associates. We're actually the biggest ENT practice in the country, far and away. I think we're five times bigger than the second biggest ENT practice in the country. So we're this big practice, and we're all in private practice, and some of us have roles in academia, but none of us are employed really by academic hospitals. 
because we're partners in this practice. And when I started, I was fresh out of residency and my hospital, I would take call and I would do surgeries where patients needed to be admitted and I would interact with the residents and the PAs. And I guess because I was right out of residency, I was probably friendlier than I am now and out outgoing. I always realize the position that the residents are in and how hard they work. And so I always try to be as friendly and appreciative and teach, right? Take the opportunities because at my particular hospital, they didn't have any employed otolaryngologists. Like it was just us consultants. And so I realized that the little interaction that they would get with an ENT, and particularly in pediatrics, a lot of what they do is ENT related. Whenever I would interact with the residents, I would try and teach as much as I could. And what eventually happened was they reached out to their program director and said, hey, can we spend time with him? Can we just go to this guy's office and hang out with him? And I was like, sure. Like, I'm not compensated for it, but that's not what you do it. It makes it more enjoyable. It adds another dimension. I've got these eager to learn pediatric residents and they're not ENTs, they're pediatricians. But when they come with me, they have to see adults too, because about a third of my practice is peds and two thirds of my practice is adults. But what happens is, you know, in peds, you have to be able to examine an ear. And when you're trying to figure out what a normal ear looks like on a wiggly two-year-old who's screaming, it's really hard to learn what a normal ear looks like. So when they're with me, they get a good volume of just like normal adult ears over and over again. And then every so often they'll see an abnormal one. And so it's really a good opportunity for them to learn. And they seem to enjoy it because they keep coming back. And I really enjoy that I get to find someone that likes to hear me talk. Most people, was it Dale Carnegie? People like, there's no sweeter sound than the sound of your own name. So this just gives me an opportunity to someone else that has to listen to me. I really do enjoy the teaching. It's almost like an accidental rotation. One of the regrets about not going into academia is I miss that aspect of it. You're a resident, you teach the juniors, you teach the medical students, and I really enjoyed that. I think you'd be hard pressed to find attendings who don't, but some really enjoy it more than others. Uh, but now that gets it back into my life. And I also, I lecture them every so often. So they call me in to give them a lecture on either head and neck infections or ear related, just a whole hour on ears. I added another one because of my podcast, which is all of the life lessons I've learned about medicine from, and so then I'll go through different episodes and like, this is what I learned in this episode that you need to know when you're done with your training and you're out as an attending buying a house and like all this other. So I've got now a third lecture on the books for them. Well, I think that's really great that you do what you do and not being in an academic institution doesn't mean that your instructors, that physicians can instruct, be preceptors. And I think that's actually going to be very important going forward because we just have so much more competition between different specialties with students, PA students, for MD students and others going for same rotations. We have more students influxing from Caribbean schools, IMGs and FMGs. I actually went to a Caribbean school myself too, so I kind of understand the need for preceptors outside of the traditional academic setting. So I really appreciate what you do. And I think obviously your residents keep coming back, but they appreciate it as well. At least with ears, when they finish, they feel more comfortable managing ears and diagnosing because it's tough. Diagnosing a middle ear infection in a small child is challenging. I guess that's an interesting segue to the next question is really asking about the certain struggles that you see with students. I guess in your specialty, being so subspecialized too, there must be very unique challenges that certain students have, especially maybe not having the experience in the ear like your pediatric residents don't for adults or something along those lines. Do you notice certain obstacles that are common or anything like that? That's the main reason. So I'm obviously an ear, nose, and throat doctor. So you'd think they'd be coming to learn about nose and throat. But generally, the ear is just so challenging to get right. And you see it so commonly in a pediatric practice. That seems to be the thing that they're real most motivated to learn about when they're with me. Like tonsillitis, it's kind of hard to miss, right? The tonsils are big and red and covered in pus because the canal is so small and narrow, you know, you need to make sure you have a good light source, you know, being able to describe what they're seeing. And then also for me to understand what they're seeing. What does it look like to you? Describe an eardrum, like it's a little hazy. It's a kind of white, kind of yellow. That could describe like a normal ear or it could describe an abnormal ear. So like I struggle with getting them to be able to describe what they're seeing. But I think overall, the big struggle being a medical student and a resident is the evolution and kind of 
figuring out where you are and where you need to be next. And what I mean by that is, like you start out as information collectors. All right, tell me what the patient told you. And when they start out, they start out just by telling me exactly what the patient told them. No filter whatsoever. So the first challenge is getting them to trust themselves enough to actually leave things out when they're telling me the history. So leave out the stuff that's not important and make sure that you're asking the patient's follow-up questions because you're trying to figure out what the diagnosis is. And a lot of times they get kind of hung up on just making sure they give me all the stuff that they're supposed to tell me, like the past medical history. And as a specialist, if they have high cholesterol, but they're here for ear pain, they're so used to presenting in a certain way. So kind of getting them out of that and just focusing on what's relevant. And then the next step, once they get better at being information collectors, right? They ask follow-up questions, they leave out the stuff that may not be relevant, and they tend to focus on the stuff that is more relevant. Then the next step in the evolution is being able to arrive at a diagnosis. So what's your differential diagnosis? Which one are you leaning towards? Why are you leaning towards it? And so the challenge, I think, is knowing where you are in the process and then taking that leap to the next step because it's uncomfortable, right? Like I just got really good at taking a history and I know how to present that. Now I have to figure out the diagnosis. Like it could be a number of things, but then leaning towards the diagnosis can help you focus on your history and hone that skill even more, right? Asking those probing questions to see if you're headed down the right path or not. And then the last is the management decisions, right? Now that you've got your differential diagnosis, what are we doing next? Are we going to try a medication? Are we going to get an imaging study or labs or what? And it's important to try and recognize where you are and then push to the next step. So once you realize that this is the process, okay, I'm just going to collect all the information and not forget it and write it down and regurgitate it back. Okay, now I'm going to try and refine that. Okay, now I'm going to refine that, but I'm also going to try and figure out what the diagnosis is and come up with options. Okay, now that I've came up with a list of diagnoses, how am I going to manage this patient? And then usually for a three-year residency program, first year is collection, second year is diagnosis, and third year is coming up with the management. But some people do it faster than others, but they all end up getting there. And that's the part I think that's important for the learners to realize is when you're done, you're going to be there. And just because you were a strong first year doesn't mean you're going to be a strong third year. And just because you weren't a strong first year doesn't mean you're not going to be a strong third year. We all get there, some faster than others, but it's important to realize where you are so you can work on getting to the next step. But until you realize that that's the process, it can be hard to know how to do that. Well, it's good to see a specific process for your specialty because especially in the first season of the show, we focused on the actual one-minute preceptor model. And that seems to work very well for more primary care-based specialties, but maybe not so well in subspecialties. So I think it's unique and nice to hear your sort of different methodology for approaching it. And I'm wondering if you have any other techniques for students that might make them more adept at this or just becoming better learners in general. Listen to podcasts. <laughs> That's something that wasn't around when I was a resident or a medical student commuting back and forth. And I think figuring out how you learn and capitalizing on that and working in groups and just listening. I think that's something we all need to be better at. Sometimes you just need to shut up and listen, like get out of your own head and listen to what you're being told. Because sometimes it's easy to get defensive. As a resident and as a medical student, you're put in so many positions where you're just made to feel like crap. You just feel inadequate. And I certainly wasn't capable of doing this. It's easier for me to tell people to do it now as an attending. But I think if you want to become a better learner, try and get out of your own head and realize that when people are telling you, like, this is what you could do to improve, it's because they want you to do better and they think you can and they believe in you and they wouldn't be wasting their breath and wasting their time if they weren't excited for you to improve in these ways. So get out of your head. Stop thinking that people are like insulting you or belittling you. I mean, they might be, and that's a different story. But a lot of times it's hard to take the advice. You end up taking it as criticism. You know, if you think about a test, what's the point of a test? Right now, the point of a test is to get a grade. But really, the point of the test is to figure out what you've learned and what you haven't learned, so then you can go back and learn it. Now, we never, ever use tests this way, right? Once you take the test, that's the end. You're done learning that subject. We're not using it as an evaluation to then go back and try and teach the things that weren't learned before. But like, 
when you're getting feedback from an attending or a senior resident or someone who's senior to you in this hierarchy, shut up, get out of your head, and try and just take it as constructive feedback and not insulting. But again, this is from someone who was not good at that. And it sounds like that's advice that gets repeated a lot in educational materials is just getting that immediate feedback. It's the best way to know what you're doing, what mistakes you might be making right then and there. And then you can start working on improving on those later. So it's not meant to be a criticism, even though maybe some instructors, some preceptors don't disseminate the information as gently as maybe they <laughs> could or should, but still that feedback is invaluable. And that's them, right? That's them. That's not you. When they do it in that cold, clinical way, that's a reflection on their ability to give constructive feedback, not a reflection on your abilities per se. I mean, obviously it is a reflection of your abilities because they're telling you about them, but like if they do it and they're not so nice about it, that's them. That's them. They got something going on. They're behind on alimony payments or you know, their second vacation home, it was flooded or, okay, I'm just using like hyperbole for the surgeons out there. You hear what I'm saying? That's their head, not yours. Well, also in many academic settings in general and in the hospital in general, there can be a lot of different, potentially unsafe practices. And obviously there are a lot of things that can happen with students, with patients, but generally like to see if you've run into anything in the past that how a student should react to maybe preceptor that's not communicating as well or maybe implementing things that the student thinks is not the safest practice. Are there any tips for these types of kind of negative interactions or how to treat them in a professional manner? So I think it's important to recognize that there is a large incongruity in, in information. The attending has more information than the student. They have more information about the patient. They have more experience. They hopefully have a larger fund of knowledge. And so the student should recognize that what's going on might actually be safe and it might be totally fine, but it doesn't make sense to them. And so what you should do is you should try to clarify that from that perspective, not an accusatory way. If you go in about accusatory way, then the attending is going to get defensive. That's just going to lead to a negative interaction. But if you're genuinely curious, like I would think that you would want to do this for this patient. Like, I don't understand why you're doing it this way. When I'm an attending, you know, I want to make sure I'm doing the right thing. So I would think that this would be the right next step, that we should get this lab before we do this to the patient. Or like, you know, I thought you were supposed to check creatinine before you get a CAT scan with contrast to make sure that the patient doesn't end up in renal failure. Just be genuinely curious, not accusatory. You really have to be as inoffensive as you can be when you're doing it. And if you are, then you might end up making them think about it. You know what? Huh. Hmm. I mean, ideally, right? You might get some a-hole who's just going to be super defensive about it, and not second guess their decision and not really feel like explaining themselves to you, right? There's nothing you can do about that. But I think the best way to go about it, the most likely to get a positive outcome is assume that it's not unsafe that you just don't understand it. And if you ask those questions to get an explanation, you're more likely to go down a productive path. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I think so. Especially if one, you're kind of trying to empathize from their perspective, from their knowledge base, that they probably know something you don't, but also in taking the time to think about how to word your question properly and maybe do, like you said, a compare and contrast. I would have thought to do this in this scenario if this was my patient. So can you please explain to me why you did it in Y scenario instead of X? I think that is a very clear method for approaching something like that. Yeah, I love that question. And just for curiosity's sake, if there are any preceptors listening now, or maybe some of the students that listen to this when they are older and become preceptors potentially, are there certain things that you would think they might want to look out for? Any experiences you had that were great learning experiences? I'm not sure the patients are going to appreciate this answer, but like if there are procedures that to be done, try and get all over them. So ENT, I'm not sure everybody knows this, but it's a surgical field. So in practice right now, in private practice, I spend four to four and a half days a week in the office 
There's certainly we do plenty of procedures, but I spend about a half a day in the operating room. When you're training, you spend about four days in the operating room and one day in the office seeing patients. So it's very surgical. You know, we spend most of our time doing surgery and the surgical skills are very widely ranged from like drilling out a mastoid bowl to doing endoscopic sinus surgery, to doing vocal cords, endoscopic surgery, to doing big open neck surgeries or like the free flap that I was just, so like a wide variety of surgical skills that you need to acquire. And the people that I saw thrive the most were the ones that dove into it. And it kind of feeds off of itself. So what happens if you dive into it, you're going to get surgical skills faster than the people that are being sheepish about it. And that's going to make you better. And that's going to make the attendings more comfortable with you which then is going to make you better. And then the attendings are going to get more comfortable with you. So it becomes cyclical. But if you're sheepish about it and you're like, "Mm, I'm not totally, I don't know. Now this should be getting less common with the more simulations that we're doing, right? So you spend like hours in a simulator gaining your skills. You're more likely to be confident and then be able to dive right in there. For all the patients listening, just know that like the attending is right on top of the resident. It's not like they're like, you know, out to lunch somewhere. They're in the room with a watchful eye, but you know, some residents start out more confident than others. And if you're the one who's not so confident, you're more likely to be like, "Mm, I don't feel comfortable, hand the instruments to the attending, and then you're not learning as much, right? Like the hands-on is really how you acquire the skills. And so it's important to, I don't know, fake it till you make it. I don't know. That doesn't sound right for surgery. It doesn't sound safe, but you get what I mean. Like you need to grab the bull by the horns and just take every opportunity to have those instruments in your hands and be the one doing it until someone wrestles it away from you because then you'll get better and they'll get more comfortable and then you'll get better and they'll get more comfortable. And then you end up leaving residency a much different surgeon than if you started out being sheepish about it. And I would imagine the same thing goes for any procedure and medical management in general, right? For all the non-procedural specialties out there, like Kind of what I was getting at before with knowing where you are in the information collector versus diagnosis versus management. If you off the bat, you're like, this is what this person has going on. This is what I think the diagnosis is. And this is what I think you should be doing. You're going to be learning a lot more than the residents that are stuck on just focusing on the history. Wrapping up here, I do like to ask a few more personal questions. And generally, you can choose either one of these if you like, or both. And that is, Either what is the biggest change you'd like to see in medicine, academic medicine in the next five to 10 years, or what accomplishment are you most proud of? My kids changed everything. I have three boys. The oldest is four. The youngest is currently nine months. They're three and three years and four months span between all three kids. You know, I'm proud of my fathering, actually, of of all of my accomplishments. But that's, that's the quick and easy answer. This question really gives me an opportunity to go on my soapbox, which is the biggest change that I hope to see in academic and clinical medicine. We're scientists, right? Teaching should be evidence-based. What are the most effective ways of teaching? We should just be utilizing those, and we should be utilizing them all of the time. Sitting in a classroom with a bunch of paintings of nothing but old white men on the walls you know, only clean shaven, respect your elders, respect the conservative hierarchy, like this old institution of medicine that's evolved over time, hasn't evolved to be the most efficient system. It just, that's how evolution works. It's haphazard. It's random. Things just get tacked on to other things. So we need to just start from scratch and figure out what is it that we need to know to be good doctors. And I think even the step behind that is how do you even define, how do we want to define what a good doctor is? So first we need to agree on a consensus on what is a good doctor, and then how do we train people to become good doctors? So what are the teaching techniques that are evolved to make sure that they have the information that they need in order to be good doctors? That's the tagline to my podcast, which is everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. Clearly I have something against the Krebs cycle here. Why? Because I don't use it ever. And I'm never going to, to treat a patient. We spend so much time in undergrad and then in med school, like memorizing these things that we never know. Like we need to burn that all to the ground and figure out what it is we need to know in order to be effective clinicians. And the fact that information is just increasing at a logarithmic rate. And so what are they going to do? They're just going to test us on more stuff and make us memorize more. That seems preposterous. Or we just get even more subspecialized. Ophthalmology has eight fellowships. 
for a little one ounce eyeball. I think that's fine that we go in that direction, but like, what do we all need to know about the eyeball to be a reasonable doctor? And does it have anything to do with biochemistry? So I think we need to ditch a lot of the stuff that we've been learning because that's the way we've always been doing it. And we need to build a system from the ground up that utilizes effective teaching methods for the information that we need to have in order to be good clinicians. And I think the first step is deciding what good is. And I think in addition to just all the clinical stuff, all the science, I think we need to focus more on the soft skills. Because if you can't talk to a patient about their weight in a meaningful way, you can know everything about the metabolism of adipose, but it's not going to make a difference in their life. We need to know how to have those conversations effectively. And if we're not being taught it in medical school, then we're going to have to learn it from our mentors. But our mentors are chosen at random. The people that you're on your rotation with, you might be someone with no social skills whatsoever. And you're learning how to take a good history from them. You're learning how to counsel on weight management from them. You can learn how to not have a productive conversation. But why don't we have some lectures on how to have a productive conversation on things like persuasion and nonverbal communication and all these soft skills that they teach in like dating school. They're trying to teach, if, you, if you're having trouble dating, you can learn this stuff. So I think we need to focus on what is the science that we need to know, but what are the soft skills that we need? Because this type of stuff is teachable. It's learnable. You can learn how to express more empathy. You can learn how to recognize your own implicit biases. From a public health perspective, that's tremendously important, right? There's a reason that African-American women, the maternal mortality is like four times out of their white counterparts. And a lot of that has to do with how they interface with the medical system. So we need to be learning that in the classroom. Like, how do we recognize our own biases? And then how do we effectively manage that so it doesn't affect patient outcomes? Because it shouldn't, but it does. So these are the types of things that we really need to be grappling with. And if we're wasting time memorizing useless facts that we're never going to need to know, it's just an inefficient use of our time, our finite time. Soapbox over. Nice. I have like eight different tangents I want to explore now with that one, but I won't take out all of your time or the audience's time with those. I would say though, quick plug, my other show, the Medical Nemesis podcast covers a lot of that stuff. So how to learn effectively evidence-based learning strategies and also memory techniques, because those seem to actually go hand in hand very well in medicine. So until they change things so that we don't have to memorize so much potentially useless information, at least we have some tools to add to our toolkit there. No, that's amazing, right? You're teaching people how to learn more efficiently, which should be done in the classroom. You shouldn't have to listen to a podcast. Like your podcast shouldn't have to exist because everyone should just know it. But the reason it exists is because we don't know it and we're never taught that. So you're teaching people how to learn more efficiently. So thank you for that. So I love all the topics that you've discussed so far, and I'm sure the audience would like to find out more about you and about your topics of interest and your show as well. Are there any other resources that you would recommend for the audience interested in ENT and also where they can find out more about you? Well, so this is my opportunity to plug my podcast. So it's called The Physician's Guide to Doctoring, and you can just find it at physiciansguidetodoctoring.com. That's the website, and there are links to all different podcast players in that. So you know, subscribe on your podcast, and where we cover some interesting things from some specialties, right? So what does every doctor need to know about ophthalmology? What does every doctor need to know about dermatology? If your friend picks up their shirt and is like, hey, what is this rash? It's important, even if you're a pathologist or a radiologist who never sees skin because their x-rays go right through the skin, you still need to be able to know that stuff. So I think that's an important resource. And if I didn't think it was an important resource, I wouldn't be spending my time recording the episodes. But we also cover a lot of those soft skills that I just had on my soapbox talking about nonverbal communication and effective interviewing, trauma-informed care, recognizing your own implicit biases. we we'll cover all that stuff and more on my show, advocating for yourself and our specialty and our profession. But I think it's also important to be well-rounded. Clearly, I'm a huge fan of podcasts. So what other resources would I recommend for people in their training? It'd be related to your hobbies and your interests. I think it's important to keep them and nurture them 
So if you play an instrument, don't give up on that instrument, right? I think there are all these studies out there that show Nobel Prize winners are more likely than their counterparts who have similar degrees but don't win Nobel Prizes to speak more languages and play more instruments and be artists because it helps you look at things from a different angle and think about things differently. It's just good for your brain. So I think it's important when we're mired in all of this to not let medicine steal your soul as it tries to do constantly. And you're constantly told about all your inadequacies and all of your responsibilities and all of these things that try to make you more uniform and make you less you. So I think it's important to keep those interests and podcasts are a great way to do it. So, you know, finding things that aren't all medicine. But that being said, there are a lot of great medicine podcasts out there as well. As far as otolaryngology, if you're interested in becoming an ear, nose, and throat doctor, then you just have to spend some time with us. You got to find someone, you know, I'm sure they'd be happy to at least take you on for a day to see what it's all about. When I was a medical student, I was a medical student at Buffalo. And at the time, there was no residency program. They had lost their accreditation a few years ago. There was a big purge and a lot of programs had lost their accreditation that weren't that big. They eventually got it back. So there's a residency program again. But while I was a student, there was none. So I had to find people to rotate with. I had to put myself out there. Certain doctors were interested and certain doctors weren't interested. You have to find those mentors and spend some time. And ENT is a cool field. I mean, Chase, do you want me to talk about why ENT is a... Is that, is that relevant to the podcast? Sure. <laughs> Let's dig into it. So otolaryngology, the saying is from the dura to the pleura. So anywhere from where the lung ends to the brain begins is where ENTs are found. And we take care of kids. We take care of adults. We take care of dizziness and hoarseness and difficulty swallowing and sinus problems. And I might see a four-day-old with tongue tie and cut their frenulum And then the next room is an 80-year-old with hearing loss and dizziness. So my day can be very varied. I might be doing a biopsy one moment and a nasal endoscopy the next, and then just taking a very long history from someone suffering from dizziness, which makes me more like a medical doctor than a surgeon. And we do the medical management, right? It's not like there's a cardiologist and a cardiothoracic surgeon, right? We do the medical management of all ear, nose, and throat problems. So you're the medical doctor and you're the surgical doctor. You are the beginning and the end of this problem, unless, of course, because I'm in private practice, you choose to send it to the academic institution for the uber complicated stuff. But there's no medical and surgical. There's just you. I take care of like multiple generations of the same family, which is great. You know, I'll see someone and say, how's grandpa doing? And, you know, and then I'll see their kid for ear tubes. So the multi-generational is a huge plus a variety of procedures that we do. You know, I talked in the beginning about the different skills that you need to have in the operating room. So the variety is just tremendous. And if you don't like the variety, then you do a fellowship and you can just become a rhinologist or a pediatric otolaryngologist or an otologist or a facial plastic surgeon or a laryngologist. So, you know, we have all these different subspecialties within otolaryngology. So if there's one that you really fixate on or one that you really don't like, you can you know, there are plenty of people that, don't, that won't see kids. They're just either not comfortable doing it or recognizing they're not very good at it. And they just choose to not see kids anymore. And that's fine too. More for me. So there are a lot of different pathways to explore for any students that might be interested or think that they're interested in going into ENT later on. Definitely. And the interesting thing is you don't really know what you're getting yourself into until you're there. So my life as a resident at an academic institution was very different than my life as a private practice attending. The stuff that I see now is very different. It's a lot more acute than the stuff that I saw in residency, where it was like a several week wait in order to get an appointment. So you see the acute stuff in the ER, but my life and what I see day to day, very different than I ever realized it would be until I was doing it. So that's an interesting thing about medicine is, you know, you think you know what you're getting yourself into, but until you're there, you really don't. I like it. Well, I've definitely learned a lot from this episode, and I think the audience is going to get a lot of value from it as well. I want to thank you again, Dr. Bradley Block from the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Our Med Student Mentor Facebook group is a great place to gain insights and ask questions. This group is full of students and educators to guide you through your clinical rotations and ask your clinical questions. So search for the Med Student Mentor Facebook group now and learn how to become the clinician or educator that you want to be.